Hey, hey, everybody, it's Brian Von VA. Indirectly, that did rhyme. Anyway, hope everybody's doing okay today. Make sure to get yourself something to drink and some snackies because we got another good in for you. Players, what was the coolest thing a DM has done for your campaign? Like, I am looking for something that really made you go, wow. Part two. As part of my first ever campaign, because I was so new to everything and had no idea of how anything worked, my DM gave my character a unique object that my character was able to communicate with, which was originally meant as a way to guide me as a player in what can be done and as a bit of a guide into the world of D&D. We're now almost a year of sessions in and my character, a monk, meditated for the first time in a while when visiting a local monastery and was trained transported to an ethereal plane or some realm of unconsciousness. The where still hasn't been fully revealed. There, my character met the NPC who had been the voice in my head and guide for almost a year, where I learned he's actually an imprisoned warlock, and now I have a side quest to try and free him of his bonds. He ordered an artwork of our party behind our backs and presented it to us as a Christmas gift. Then he took a poem our bard wrote and hired some people to make it an actual song. Awesome piece, honestly. Plus, he puts tons of effort on the campaign, which has been running weekly for a year and a half. So, our big bad was this guy called Peculiar Jacques. Jacques was an anarchist whose only real goal was to watch the world. We had recently taken up employment with this gentleman named Lord Platt. Platt considered it to be his sworn duty to maintain order at all costs. Honestly, he was a bit of a square, but he paid well. This put us at odds with Jacques, who had a habit of showing up and making our lives miserable. He was a master of illusion magic who liked to bring our worst nightmares to life. The DM based him on a mix between the Joker and it. As time goes by, we get a quest to investigate a prison colony on an island off the coast. The colony went dark about three weeks prior, and the Inquisition was curious to know why. Platt had a secret research facility on the island, which is why we got involved. The Inquisition allowed us to go to the island under the condition that one of their guys escorts us. Enter Sturgis the Practical. On the boat ride in, Sturgis was kinda standoffish, but we chalked it up to him being with the Inquisition. Those dudes are always weird. We get to the island and everything is coated in vines. Like every conceivable surface had a thick layer of rope thick. What's worse is the place is crawling with these weird plant creatures that hunt down anyone who tries to damage the vines. Many fights ensue, and Sturgis becomes an invaluable teammate. Over the next few IRL weeks as we explore the mysteries of this island, we even become friends with him. We discover that the vines were created by an object called the Hate Seed, which was what Platt's people were experimenting with in the research facility. We battle through hell and high water to recover the seed, and our warlock nearly dies in the final battle. Sturgis literally carries him to safety as the facility collapses around us. We make it back to the boat and finally sigh a breath of relief. As things calm down, the warlock decided to go to Sturgis' room to thank him for saving his life. As he approaches the door, he's met by a terrible smell. He enters the room and discovers Sturgis' rotting corpse, by the looks of which has been decaying for several days. Before we even set foot on the island, just then the boat is rocked by an explosion. We head to where we stored the hate seed and find it missing. We rush to the deck and we find Sturgis standing holding a red balloon. He begins to fly away as the illusion fades, revealing that he was Peculiar Jacques all along. He could have killed us on that island multiple times. He could have let the warlock die. He wanted us to live with the knowledge that he had beat us. That he was better than us. He wanted to hurt us. In a recent finale-ish battle where we got unexpectedly ambushed by the big bat of the campaign, some random guy joins the call. Turns out, he's a friend of the DM, and he's been controlling the Hobgoblin General behind the scenes for 18 months without our knowledge. Hell, he'd been silently watching that particular game for three whole hours before this encounter even began. An absolute massacre ensued, with a dramatic player death and a Pyrrhic victory in which we killed him off, but had to flee with no loot or even the bodies of Player 3 slash their follower. 
I want to focus on an in-game story. My cleric of Muhammad had died buried in ice to an ancient white dragon, a poetic death considering he became a cleric after a silver dragon saved him from an avalanche. The incident made him quite claustrophobic. <laughs> Same. However, we were playing Rise of Tiamat, and I was clearly motivated to keep playing my character. Before the next session, my DM talked to me about an article she had read about reincarnated platinum dragonborn and whether or not I would be interested in coming back as one. I said I was, but she he said it would depend upon if the party would fail on the Mercer-style resurrection skill challenge. The party still had a chance of bringing me back as a human without divine intervention from Bahamut. That skill resurrection was one of the most memorable sessions of D&D I'd ever been in, and wasn't even a participant for the resurrection, obviously. A couple of sessions earlier, our group had found a black dragon egg. My cleric, seeing Chromatic Kind as his sworn enemy, wanted to destroy the egg, but the wizard convinced him to give it a chance at life. Nonetheless, the egg was used as a tribute during the resurrection ritual. The success of the resurrection skill challenge is decided by a secret role. Since my cleric came back as a platinum dragonborn, I knew the role had failed, but the other PCs and players didn't, so it was an exciting moment for them too. What I liked the best about is that it obviously allowed me to continue playing the character I wanted to play, but thinking back to how I had played my character, I also had the impression that the resurrection wasn't just the DM taking pity because she had made resurrection harder. It felt like, of all people on the Sword Coast, my loyal and devoted cleric would be the one Bahamut would bring as the first platinum dragonborn in perhaps living memory to face off against Tiamat. Perhaps in fooling myself, but it felt earned. And that part, I really liked. We horribly failed a mission and my warlock and another PC were captured and tortured. Entirely out of ideas for how to get out of this, I asked my patron, whom I didn't even know the identity of, for help. I think most DMs would say that since it isn't an actual ability, it won't work. But, to my surprise, the DM went along with it. My patron possessed my warlock, killed all of our captors, and almost killed the other PC. This led to a plot arc where that would continue to happen when I got angry, a la the Hulk. And later, we found an NPC possessed by the same force. It was a lot of fun and only occurred because my DM was willing to take this and run with it. We played through Lost Mine of Fandelver and made a random goblin our Warforged Druid dubbed Friend Goblin the new chief of Cragmaw Hideout. Our druid taught her the secrets of agriculture and cultivating plants, and persuaded them to stop raiding the Tribor Trail and become self-sufficient instead. Friend Goblin became a druidic acolyte. As we encountered more goblins, we usually forced them into surrendering and then checked to see if they'd be interested in joining Friend Goblin and the rest of the farming commune we set up. We sent four more to her, and an ogre too. After finishing up in Fandalin, we had some plot threads hanging in Neverwinter that have the DM has developed into their own homebrew campaign. We stopped at Kragma Hideout for the first proper visit in weeks, and it was the best experience of the entire campaign. The DM had created numerous goblin NPCs, all training in different classes, because they wanted to be adventurers like us. They all had automatic poetic names like Zap the Wizard or Crash the Barbarian. The entire map had been redone with creeping vines and rows of crops, extra furniture, areas where you could see each individual goblin we sent to the commune had set up their bed rolls and personal effects. The goblins told each other stories about our party, passed down through their leader. We spent the night feasting and chatting with them before continuing on our way. And the druid cast plant growth through the night with her goblin acolyte to make their crops even more bountiful. It was a really bittersweet callback to our first session, seeing how far we'd come since then. Reminiscing about my cleric's first death saving throws, I'm notorious for getting absolutely wrecked with crits, even as a hill dwarf with high con. The battle with Clark, interrogating and then befriending the goblins. One of our player characters had died in Wave Echo Cave, and we were still emotional about that from earlier in the session where we held their funeral. Seeing all these goblins we had sent one by one to live a more peaceful life, and and the changes we effected upon the hideout was really gratifying. Our DM was a first timer too, and she knocked it out of the park with this callback. If we ever get tired of this campaign, maybe we'll take on the characters of the goblins and try to do some all goblin shenanigans. 
the DM made a database of magical books in the library at the campaign's wizard school. The books have magical insights and hidden spells in them. Each entry has a subject, a title, and the name of the wizard that authored the book. The insights and spells are visible only to the DM and must be researched for the PCs to find them. At the moment, there are something like 435 books in the database organized by School of Magic and topics like plane travel or alchemy. We had been playing for about a year in a homebrew world our DM made with a fellow DM. Each of them had their own group, but it was a shared world, so things we did in our game could affect things in their game and vice versa. We had shared a messenger group where we could leave mail for each other, and that was the main way we interacted. Their group had been investigating a nobleman that seemed to be the main villain of their game. Our group had been going up against a cult that seemed to be planning a big ritual to do something. So our DM asks if we want to do a longer session for next time and do it on a Saturday so we could barbecue and hang out after. We have sailed to a little island group some way out from the port city that has served as the main setting of the campaign. We have gone ashore and are investigating the island when we spot someone pulling a boat ashore. And right at that very moment, we saw two cars pull up and the other group and their DM get out. The other people we saw is literally the other group. We then proceeded to have the grand finale of the campaign together with the other group. The nobleman is actually second in command for the cult, and the leader is a sea witch. The pull all the wreckages around the island together into a giant structure, on top of which they start to conduct the ritual. There are two paths up and our groups mix and split up into two new parties to take each side on and end with a giant battle on top of the shipwreck tower. It took months of planning and our DM confessed later that it hadn't totally worked as he wanted as the other group went way off script and had a campaign restart. Our DM also didn't agree on some of the world building choices the other DM made and the groups didn't interact as much as they wanted, the idea was to leave clues for the other group so we then could exchange clues. We did give a recap, but only rarely followed up on the stuff the other group found, and the same with them. But even though things didn't go exactly to plan, that finale is still one of the most epic campaign endings I have tried. Hi everybody, Brian Von Vey here, making sure to check in after the vid. Be sure to leave a like, subscribe, and ring the bell so you can get notified whenever we post a new video or go live. And since the algorithm lords always need a blood sacrifice, please leave a comment down below letting me know how you're doing, because honestly, if you don't, we're going to be sent to the Shadow Realm. If you'd like to share a story with us, by the way, the best spot is on our subreddit r slash Mr. Ripper. And of course, if you want to check out more content, check us out on Twitter and Twitch. Links are going to be in the description below. And using a help action, come say hi to me, Brian Von Vier, over on YouTube, where I voice your D&D characters, make voice acting memes, and stream tons of games, some of which are near and dear to my heart. As always, I try to end on a positive, and I just wanted to say to not only DMs of the world, but anyone who's creative, anyone who shares a personal experience in the comments, or anyone who DMs me, or anybody out there who ever shares a piece of their imagination or their heart and soul, I appreciate it. Not a lot of people do these days, but reading all these stories of how a DM will go above and over achieve for some simple thing that most people would just overlook, it inspires me because I get to see that people all around the world are willing to go the extra mile to make someone happy or to entertain their crew. And I try to do that for you guys and gals all the time. And I get to read so many of your comments saying how you've had a good day at school, how you've lost a job or got a job, and everything that you talk about is inspiring and I appreciate every last bit of effort you put into everything that you say and do, DM or otherwise. All the love out there, be safe, be happy, and I will see you next time. Bye for now.